I suggest we start. I would like to welcome you to the current panel entitled Civil Society Today. My name is Norbert Zensig and I'm a researcher at the WZB and I will guide you through this panel. Both for Ralf Dahrendorf and for many other leading researchers and analysts, civil society was and is equivalent uh, with a democratic corrective to the power of the state and the elites. The assumption so far seems to have been that a pluralistic civil society safeguards democ democracy. But does this assessment still apply to the present, in which we can also observe the upswing of right-wing populists and illiberal protest movements worldwide? Do we have to rethink the previous assumptions about the function and functioning uh, of civil society? Or to put it differently, what significance does civil society have for democracy today? These are the guiding and, from my point of view, pressing questions for this panel. Most fortunately, we were able to attract leading ex experts from the field to this uh, panel to discuss these uh, questions. I want to keep my introductory remarks brief so that we, can, uh, that we have more time for the presentations and discussion. First, I would like to welcome Professor John Keane again, but now, uh, and this time as a speaker, uh, Sascha Kneipp already mentioned uh, he is Professor of Politics at the University of Sydney and at the uh, WZB. Just to pick a few highlights why we invited as a speaker for this panel, he is the co-founder and director of the Sydney Democracy Network. For many years he has been researching the importance of civil society for democracy. In this context he shaped the model of monitoring, monitoring uh, democracy. Assessing the current developments, he argues that civil society becomes his own enemy. Second, we welcome Dr. Christina Arato as a speaker. Uh, she's an associate professor and deputy director at ELTE, a university faculty of law, Institute of Political Science in Budapest. She's currently, currently the president of the Hungarian Political Science Association. For many years, she has also done research on the role of civil society in Eastern Europe and in the context of the European Union. She argues that populism in Eastern Europe is a threat to civil society. The contributions of the two will be discussed uh, by Professor Helmut Anheyer. He is a professor of so sociology at the Hertie School and at Heidelberg University. He was president at the Hertie School and is academic co-director of the Darmdorf Forum a joint initiative by the Hattie School and the LSE, funded by Stiftung Mercator. He's also an expert on the roles of civil society, among other things. Without further ado, I'm looking forward to the lecture by John Keane. This stage is yours. Norbert. Um, as far as I know, uh, Ralf Darendorf never used uh, the word saudadia, uh, an evocative, uniquely Portuguese uh, word you may know, but a word I think we need to express uh, the presence of his absence, uh, the feelings of pain that he is no longer in our midst, mixed with happiness that we are gathered to remember him, saudadia the realization that thanks to him, we are more aware of what makes us who we are in these times and what really matters in our lives. For the awareness of the important uh, idea and ideal of civil society, Zivilgesellschaft, we owe a great debt to Ralph Darendorf. I found, um, when in London, that he practiced its virtues in his daily encounters, often with a sense of humor. Shortly after I was appointed as a professor at the very ripe old age of 34, Ralph Dor Darendorf took me aside to explain how important being a professor is and explained in a kind of self-mocking way that he was Professor Lord Darendorf and that for 19th century reasons, Professor was more important than being a Lord. 
Um, I also had um, uh, the joy of and uh, uh, witnessing his generous civility in a project with Jürgen Kocker on um, civil society in Europe, where he, Ralf Dorendorf, contributed a very fine piece on what he came to call Erasmian intellectuals, those who in the 20th century uh, refused to be cowards, Mitläufer, the untenables who refused to fall in love with arbitrary power. All this encouragement and support had a great influence on my way of being in the world and my way of thinking about the topic of civil society. Um, and certainly his own thinking uh, remains important. How he came to uh, embrace uh, this category, uh, I have no time to tell. It would be a story that uh, includes uh, his uh, closeness to Karl Popper. We cannot know, we can only guess, as an anthem that Ralph repeatedly um, uh, spoke about. It would require thinking about his uh, Homo Sociologicus, uh, published when he was only 30 years old, which has in it the whole idea um, of multiple social roles. It would also be making sense of how he came to embrace this category of civil society. It would include his work with David Lockwood on conflict sociology, the critique the importance of intermediary associations and the critique of the then reigning Parsonian uh, functionalism and its integrationist bias. I have no time to speak about this, but only to say that through um, these moves intellectually that Ralph Durandorf made, he helped pave the way for the revival of the idea and practice of civil society in a period 40 years ago when uh, I'm old enough to remember that that phrase um, was very often a conversation stopper. Uh, people's eyebrows raised or they frowned um, in various languages, not knowing what sense to make of this phrase. There were, of course, exceptions. There were political thinkers and historians who pointed out that from Aristotle, koinonia politike, uh, through to early modern political writers such as Hobbes and Locke, civil society meant a well-governed polity. Uh, those historians also pointed out that sometime during the 18th century, the term civil society underwent a transformation so that it came in the writings of Adam Ferguson and Hegel and Tocqueville, Marx and others, to refer to uh, an ensemble of non-governmental associations and institutions separate from government and the state. And there was also the exception of the Gramscians, who um, in various uh, contexts um, held on to the category of societa civile. But these were exceptions, and there were contexts, Germany included, where the very phrase, Bürgerliche Gesellschaft, um, had negative connotations, so much so that I remember during my first days in Berlin that a neologism was created. Zivilgesellschaft got over the, the, the negative connotations of bourgeois uh, society. There were also contexts, for example, the Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia, where there were no words in Czech to describe um, civil society as we later came to use it, so that obchanska spolechnost, that's the limit of my check, uh, was actually a neologism to describe um, an ensemble of non-governmental associations and dynamics uh, that uh, acted, so to say, at arm's length from uh, state institutions. Uh, it happened around 1980 and in those early years of that decade that the category became what German scholars call um, a basic concept, a Grundbegriff, a word that attracted a great deal of attention, stirred up a lot of public controversy, and came to be a phrase used in newspapers and books and pamphlets and, of course, helped to spark 
political resistance and major political upheavals in several continents. Why did this happen? Why is it that the term um, uh, came to mean what it did? Um, well, to be as ecumenical as possible, the term, of course, uh, had many meanings. Uh, it was one of the reasons for its success. It had a polysemic quality. But put in a, in a way, um, in an ideal typish sense, civil society referred to the creative chaos, Ralph Darendorf's uh, lovely phrase, a lively mosaic of non-governmental initiatives, networks, and institutions through which citizens non-violently with a measure of self-awareness and civility and fearless self-confidence live their lives, feel at home, as Ralph often emphasized, um, at the same time as often pitting themselves against one another, transforming themselves, peacefully resolving their conflicts with each other within a framework of government and law. That is um, put uh, very uh, generally, that is the understanding of civil society that came to mobilize um, uh, opinion and uh, create, uh, generate uh, great discussions uh, from roughly 1980 onwards. And this was not just a European phenomenon, it happened in practically every uh, continent. The question is, why did this happen? I think there was a small handful of reasons. The phrase itself was descriptively attractive. It helped understand what happened um, in those early months of the 1980s in Poland with the birth of Solidarność. This was the refusal of a one-party state by an independent trade union uh, with social uh, backing. Um, it was used um, as well to describe the new social movements as um, they were called in this period. The rebirth of feminism, of black empowerment, the birth of green politics. There was also, I think, the uh, descriptive attraction of the phrase because at the very beginning of neoliberalism, um, advocates of civil society emphasized that there was such a thing as society. This is surely um, a key uh, theme of Homo sociologicus of Ralph Darendorf. Um, the fact of society, as he put it in an almost Durkheimian way, was a challenge to, for instance, the view of Friedrich von Hayek that talk of society is, and I'm quoting, nonsense, like talk of the moral stone. Well, there was such a thing as society according to the champions of uh, civil society in this point. It was a critique of the methodological individualism of that early neoliberalism. There was also, thinking about its um, renaissance and its flourishing, there was also the fact that it had um, real organizing potential. The phrase became a stanza in the poetry of practical non-violent resistance to total state power. It was the language of the Charter 77, as I've mentioned, the core idea of Solidarność uh, in Hungary, in Yugoslavia, and elsewhere. And it was a phrase that began to catch on in the United Nations, the World Bank, Amnesty International, the Ford Foundation, Open Society Foundation, and so on. There was also, I think, the point uh, that the whole field of transitology in the field of democracy um, uh, was uh, uh, very much a carrier of this whole idea of civil society. It transformed the meaning of democracy. Democracy meant not just free and fair elections, but the nonviolent building of networked associations that kept or built in attention within um, a any given uh, polity. It also, I think, um, flourished as a phrase in this period because it, it prompted a rethinking of power. Uh, around the same time that Michel Foucault famously wrote that in political thought and practice, we had still not cut off the head of the king. It's one of my favorite phrases from Foucault. I think that um, as far as I know in Central Eastern Europe, 
um, there was no reading of Foucault. And yet what was interesting is the way that the language of civil society transformed the understanding of power. Power was not just up there, it was not just from a barrel of a gun, it was not synonymous with state institutions. Power was no rabbit's foot, it was no lucky charm that grants rulers uh, the magical ability to uh, perform wonders. Power is everywhere. Power um, exists within households, among friends, within local associations, and it followed from this view that transformations at, that, um, at those micro levels could have actually macro effects. And then finally, the attractiveness of this uh, in these years of the 1980s and early 1990s, the attractiveness of civil society in which Ralph Darendorf uh, participated and uh, contributed to, um, uh, was at a normative level. It refused. It was a category that called on people to refuse utopias of social harmony and politically enforced order. To speak of a civil society implied public and private respect for lived disagreements about norms. It called on citizens to abide by the principle of live and let live. And I remember in this period that the often quoted words of the German playwright Friedrich Hebel um, were cited. Um, life was supposed to be like a good play in which everyone is right. I mean, that spirit infused the language of civil society. Um, and it uh, served as a phrase that implied, of course, the necessity of open communications media, freedom of association and assembly, nonviolence, respect for dignity of individuals and groups. And I did an interview with Ralph Darendorf when I was very young, the right to be different, um, to live with contradictions, as he liked to say. Um, it all pointed to uh, the fact that here on, um, uh, society, democracy, these generic categories, should include this um, attention to particularity, to uh, complexity of things, as we heard in the video clip. And this um, reception of civil society transformed, uh, from my point of view, uh, the very uh, normative meaning of democracy. Um, it came to mean uh, a political form, a way of life, in which predatory power was not cool. Power, predatory power, needed humbling. Um, accountability mechanisms became very central from the point of view of the civil society perspective. And the whole idea for me, the normative ideal of a monetary democracy was born of this um, this emphasis on civil society. Democracy and even um, the sovereign people principle came to be challenged. Um, I think that in this period, talk of the sovereign people had uh, produced a certain allergic reaction among the champions of civil society because of their emphasis on the brokenness of the polity, of the complexity of people, flesh and blood people, living their lives. I think around the year 2000, roughly, um, civil society suffered a certain downfall. It suffered misfortunes, uh, and two things happened uh, for uh, at least a decade, uh, or perhaps a decade and a half. Um, this is a bit of a tragedy, a story which has a tragic feel uh, to it. Um, and I know Ralph Dorendorf resisted this trend, but the two trends uh, that intersected uh, from around the year 2000, as far as I uh, can recall, and I'm here reconstructing, is that the term itself began to lose um, public visibility. Um, partly this was because of an outright banning of the phrase. Um, uh, in June of this year, uh, Putin at the G20 meeting um, included civil society plus multiculti and some other ideals as ideals that, quote, had outlived their purpose. Um, the Chinese Communist Party in 2013 issued a ban on the use of the phrase gongmin shuhui. Um, it cannot anymore 
and until today be used in official publications. It's still used at university level um, defiantly, uh, but um, th th these kinds of things happened and, um, and there were uh, other reasons for the decline of public visibility of the language of civil society. A lot of intellectual critiques happened uh, during the 90s and the early 2000s. Michel Foucault uh, famously complained that there was a kind of Manichaeism, Manichaeism built into the category, you know, society is good, state is bad. This was, I think, not the widespread understanding. Um, there were Republicans, Republican thinkers who said that the common good, the public good, was dissolved by all of this talk of, of multiple uh, norms. Amitai Etzioni went for one of the books I published with a very harsh review of that kind. There were socialists like Edward Thompson who accused me uh, of actually um, calling into question the advances of socialism in Central Eastern Europe. If you go talking about civil society, this means you ally yourself with the dissidents and therefore you're weakening the historical evolution of, of socialism. The League of Communists in Yugoslavia, just on the point of collapse, accused me of being a bourgeois apologist, um, which was, uh, but I was called many other things. Um, old Labour supporters in Britain said I was a left-wing Thatcherite for championing the language of civil society, or a liberal, or a cosmopolitan, um, or a Foucauldian. And some of you will not know that in 2009, in the opening trial of more than 100 intellectuals and journalists in Iran, I was named with Dick Rorty and Jürgen Habermas as three of the masterminds of the velvet counter-revolution because we use the category of, of civil society. So um, these were some of the reasons why the phrase disappeared. There was also, I think, these are harsh uh, words, but I do think that the language of civil society, the bearers of that language, collaborated, so to say, with the neoliberal project. Civil society, to put it very crudely, came to be synonymous with the third sector, you know, state, market, civil society. Civil society does philanthropy. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't bother itself directly with property questions, nor directly with questions of state. And it's interesting in this period that the language of governance uh, took root, a uh, peculiarly subjectless, as Klaus Offer has pointed out, um, uh, term, uh, that referred to problem solving, stable and harmonious steering, and so on. Civil society went missing. The category came to be seen as merely synonymous with that third uh, sector. Um, it was in this period, of course, that Jürgen Habermas, I think, contributed to its decline by um, defining very narrowly civil society as a synonym for the Lebensfeld, for the, for the life world, um, and concentrating especially on the capacity of civil society to, to develop uh, public uh, communication, free and open uh, communication. Uh, there are many things to be said about that narrowing down, but it seems to me, here is the good news, and I will uh, finish, do I have five? Okay, um, uh, that there are trends um, that we can see signs of renewal of the category, and I think there are four of them, and I want just to end on this, and I will say this very briefly and too crudely. One trend is, I think, that um, the combination of market failures, financialization of capitalism, and so on and so forth, um, returns the social question. Uh, to practically every actually existing democracy. This is Karl Polanyi's term, but the idea is that um, neoliberalism, the uh, fetish of marketization, uh, actually produces, uh, it has deep social consequences, it has uncivil effects. And for that reason, there are efforts now underway to try to decommodify civil society, um, to socialize markets, that is to re-embed um, market mechanisms in the structures of civil society. You can see this in efforts, um, for instance, in the United States, uh, campaigns to pressure the tech giants, Facebook and Google, 
who have just announced earlier this year that each will give a billion dollars to the homeless. I mean, this was a, a, a move of civil society networks insisting that they should pay uh, for the social consequences of their uh, operations. There are initiatives like De Correspondent, the most successful Dutch media platform that um, is firmly rooted in civil society. It's a business as well. Um, there are B Corporation initiatives, social housing, basic income schemes mentioned by Timothy, uh, the strengthening of trade unions, etc. All of this is, I think, um, the symptom of the return of the social question and the importance of civil society, so to say, um, uh, arguing and struggling for the embeddedness of um, commodity production and exchange and taming its predatory effects. Second trend, um, these are all interconnected. I call them digital mutinies. There's lots to be said about the unfinished communications revolution of our time. I've tried to write um, as much as I can about it. But one thing is clear, despite all the talk of surveillance, capitalism, and so on, um, digital mutinies, it's my phrase, are becoming chronic. Hong Kong-style mutinies against arbitrary power. They happen in Russia, they happen in Saudi Arabia, they happen in China daily. Um, they are digitally networked um, efforts to call into question the abuse of power. And this is very clearly happening, I think, on the green politics front. I think there's a third trend. It can be simply called the militarization of policing. I'm old enough to remember the days when police were good chaps and, and chapesses and they had very limited helmet equipment and they might have had a trunch. And, um, have a look at what is going on in the United States. The militarization of policing is a very striking uh, trend, partly fed by um, the return of equipment from war fronts like Afghanistan and Iraq, but the spreading of, for example, SWAT um, uh, uh, raids. 50,000 a year happen on average at the moment in the United States. That's 137 each day. The reaction of communities um, in this so-called trade-off of freedoms and, and policing, the reaction is negative. You know, um, citizens in local civil societies feel that, almost finished, that they are uh, living in occupied war zones. And I think finally, the new populism, which is bound up with these trends, um, is something like an autoimmune disease of civil societies, of anxious, angry civil societies. Parts of civil society give themselves over to this new populism, but this new populism, it needs to be better defined than I can do in this space of time. Um, talk of the people, um, demagogues, the busting of monetary democratic institutions, the whiff of violence, the outgrouping of peoples, especially Muslims and foreigners, is producing a backlash uh, in support, for example, of politicians, Joe Cox, Henrietta Reika, Andreas Holstein, Walter Lübcke. Um, it's also generating resistance um, about the incivilities that are spreading because of this populism. Um, campaigns against sexual harassment, the defense of sanctuary cities, police monitoring groups, and so on. Um, what of the future? Uh, well, uh, one point, it came up in the previous session, is that these remarks on civil society suggest that time's arrow uh, flies not in a straight single line, that braided rhythms, multiple tempos, are part of this dynamic, this phenomenon of civil society. There are plenty of forces that are destructive of civil society institutions, and yet there are these initiatives um, and practical institutionalized defenses of civil society. Ralph Darendorf um, knew that one of the, and wrote that one of the striking things about civil societies in all of their creative chaos is that they stir up a sense of Möglichkeitssinn. This is um, Musil's um, argument, uh, Robert Musil. Um, they stir up, stir up a sense of possibility um, that things can be other than they are now. 
but what does this mean in practice? Well, Ralph Darendorf um, famously wrote and said many times, you can write a constitution in six months, you can build electoral systems in maybe six years that function. A civil society takes 60. Um, what we're witnessing, I think, um, is the corollary that it's very quick. Time can, um, it can happen very quickly that civil societies are dissolved and destroyed. Um, what are the chances of the survival of this ideal of civil society? Uh, well, I think Ralph Darendorf would be the first to say that um, whether or not civil society is survive in any particular context, whether it's Hong Kong or Chile uh, or inside the European Union, depends ultimately on politics, democratic politics, politics that decides who gets what, how much, when, and how, and why. Only politics will decide whether this old ideal of civil society uh, survives and flourishes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now I give the word to Christina Arato. Okay. I think it works, yes. Dear Lady Dahlendorf, uh, dear Professor Merkel, dear colleagues, I'm truly honored to be here today, remembering Ralph Dahrendorf. Uh, his thoughts have been influential and highly important in the democratic world, especially in East Central Europe, during and after uh, regime changes that actually started exactly... Okay, that started exactly 30 years ago. Uh, Ralph Dahrendorf was, tru uh, was truly interested in our region, he understood many of our problems like few thinkers of his times. time. He was also a public intellectual who found it important not only to write and speak for the academic community, but also to everyday people. The statement, uh, or better to say bon mot, that we actually just heard, uh, that has been widely quoted for him, from him, and the one that I heard from him first it was this 661, that constitutional reform, he told us, uh, may take a mere six months, economic reform six years, but 60 years are barely enough to lay the social foundations required. This was a sober assessment of the prospects for bringing civil society to life. So I first heard his name when I was a junior professor of political science in Budapest, uh, in the mid-1990s. Dahlendorf was saying things that were highly appealing to me and many people of my generation. I was 20 years old in 1989. When I went to vote for the first time, uh, it was in 1990, uh, the first free and fair elections in Hungary. The socialism I experienced before as a secondary school student was a collapsing and ridiculous old man's world. My class actually left the communist youth organization simply by refusing, by actually forgetting, to pay the membership fee, and no one ever noticed. My headmaster gave me some is that to read. The regime change, our revolution, as Timothy Gartonesh said, came to my life as something natural. It was somehow obvious that the future of my country was that of the West, democracy and market economy. Although there was a high price to pay for older generations, sudden rise of unemployment, experiencing competition in the economy and in politics that was unusual to a lot of older people, I myself thought that our region is on the right track. I liked the idea about the potential to evolve into a society where debate is natural, where people agree or disagree on several issues and they still belong to the same political community. As Ralph Dahlendorf said, the idea of civil society was so important in East Central Europe because it was such an obvious counterpoint of monopolistic structures 
that we experienced before. And I quote here, civil society provides the lifeblood of liberty. It creates creative, its creative chaos of associations gives people the chance to live their lives without having to go begging to the state or to other powers. It protects us against the inconveniences of the state of nature, but also against those arising from monopolistic claims by self-appointed minorities and indeed majorities. Uh, he quotes James Madison, one of the authors of the Federalist Papers, which prepared the American Constitution. Civil society is broken into so many parts, interests, and classes of citizens that the rights of individuals or of the minority will be in little danger from the interested combination of the majority." End of quote. That was around the early 1990s. The enthusiasm of fresh democratization, the potential reunification of Europe. However, we are far from a happy ending, from a scenario of all lived happily ever after. While it may have seemed in the early 1990s that history is over, that the West won the Cold War and found the winning combination of liberal democracy and market economy, and I believe the zeitgeist really made us feel so, things changed. Our world has been facing several challenges. Um, instead of the bipolar world, we first had unipolarism, then multipolarism. Economic challenges, financial crisis, unemployment, economic restructuring, Partial recoveries uh, ca characterized our last 10 years. The environmental problems pose new questions to our industries and political systems as well. The world of labor is so different that our grandparents would never recognize it. Communication between people changed fundamentally. We look down on our phones all the time, share our lives with the world like never before. Still, we are close to our opinion bubbles like never before. Among all these developments, populism emerged. This concept became so popular, taken as an explanation for all of our problems, that the word was announced as the Cambridge Dictionary Word of the Year in 2017. In East Central Europe, the emergence of populism even preceded the crisis. Ivan Krastev, who is going to be with us tomorrow, already in 2007 wrote about the strange death of the liberal consensus and the emergence of populism in Slovakia, Bulgaria, Poland, and Hungary. Orban was Trump before Trump, said Steve Bannon in 2018 when he visited Hungary. Populism, as a sign of the crisis of liberal democracy, got to the center of attention uh, also in social sciences. We are trying to figure out what it is a way of governance or a thin ideology. We are trying to explore why exactly people vote for them, for social and economic reasons, or there is a cultural identity explanation. There are huge research projects built around it, trying to identify how populism affects economics, policy making, and so on. However, I think that maybe we overdid the use of this concept. Columnists on populism suggest that there is this global art starting from Trump through Brexit as far as Orban. Maybe there are things in common. Populist leaders we know who are usually charismatic like to pose as one of the masses, one of the people who are fundamentally good against the elite that is corrupt and out of touch of everyday life, the usual definition of populism. These features we find uh, in several political systems of our time. Still, I think this concept sometimes hides more than it reveals. I argue that while in certain, mostly Western, populist systems, people might speak less about civil society, its definition and basic mo modus operandi are not fundamentally challenged. In East Central Europe, they are. The children of 1989 who read and heard La Rav Tarendorf are witnessing the reconceptualization of civil society. 
East Central European populist governments challenge the basics of democracy, including the very meaning and the role of civil society. I would like to concentrate in the next minutes uh, with looking at how this alternative understanding looks like on the example of Hungary. First, we witness the reframing of the very definition of civil society. This reframing went through using communication tools, the police and the tax office targeting, especially civil society organizations that are carrying out advocacy and watchdog activities. They are active in the field of anti-corruption, monitoring public spending, public procurement and other government policies, human rights, right to fair trial, also in the case of migrants and the like. These organizations have been listed in newspapers and magazines that are ideologically close to the government. They were accused by government officials of supporting opposition parties, suggesting that they are fake civil society organizations, in reality carrying out party political activities. The Hungarian Prime Minister called them paid political activists, paid by foreigners. These foreigners being George Soros, uh, but also the Norwegian government funding the Norway Civic Fund. There was a well-known example of police search using ex excessive force against Ökotash Foundation. You can see it on the picture above. As the distributing organization of the, for the Norway Civic Fund in Hungary in 2014. The government control office was instructed by the Prime Minister himself to carry out inquiries against these organizations. Some of them had their tax numbers suspended that led to the temporary suspension of their entire work. Second, illiberal governments in East, East Central Europe have their pet civil society organizations. In Hungary, the Civil Cooper Cooperation Forum was established in 2009 and is known for organizing so-called peace marches. You can see it on the other picture above. Uh, defending Hungary from evil forces like multinational companies, the IMF or the current European Union, with the slogan of we are not going to be a colony. You, you see that on the picture. And pro-government statements. Uh, it can be categorized as an ancillary organization directly connected to Fidesz. While these organizations aim at activating party supporters, deepening their connections to the party and give them personal experience of participation, CCF claims to belong to civil society. However, their definition of civil society is unique. They are there to protect the country from outsiders. In their own understanding, CCF is not just a member of civil society. It claims to be civil society itself to coordinate and mobilize people to work together for the country. Third, government decisions is, in modern democracies are built extensively on consultations with organizations representing groups operational in the area concerned. In Hungary, the government dissolved the Tripartite Council for Interest Representation in 2011 and re-established the entire labor code without effective participation of trade unions and employers' organizations. The Hungarian parliament accepted 266 pieces of legislation on the basis of the proposals of government MPs between 2010 and 14, six times more than in the previous government period. It is significant from the side of consultation because if a proposal is submitted by an MP, it got, does not have to go through any consultative procedure that is a must for ministerial proposals according to the Act of Hungarian Lawmaking. Consultation, on the other hand, is a key concept for the Orban government. In the post-2010 so-called national system of cooperation, several so-called national consultations were held. You can see them up there. Uh, national consultations are questionnaires received by each citizen with the right to vote that should be sent back to the government for free via mail or online. National consultations were organized in 2011 about the new constitution. 
in 2012 about economic and social issues, in 2015 about immigration and terrorism, and in 2017 on Brussels. Verifiable data about the results of the consultation are not available. Uh, only political communication indicated how many questionnaires were sent back and how people answered to the closed questions. Also, no one checks whether, whether one person sent back more sheets on paper or online. The questions that are asked in these consultation questionnaires are biased. They clearly indicate the answer that is preferred by the government. In 2017, national consultation on the subject uh, of which was how citizens like the influence of the European Union, Brussels, in, on Hungary, uh, it was supported by the Stop Brussels campaign on the streets and the media. You can see the, uh, um, the billboard. Uh, on, the, on the right above. The questionnaire was so biased that even the European Commission, that does not usually react on issues concerning internal politics in member state, <coughs> states, found it necessary to express that it included false information. You can see this facts matter uh, picture above. Thus, while Ralf Dahrendorf defined civil society as a creative chaos of associations, that give people a chance to live their lives without having to go begging to the state. The reframed concept of civil society in illiberal democracies of East Central Europe refers to coordinating and mobilizing people to work together. Understanding the entire nation as civil society brings back the idea of monolithic structures that Darendorf opposed so vividly. Receiving plenty of funding from state-owned companies, ancillary organizations categorize organizations as real ones themselves, and fake ones, those who are critical about several policies carried about by the government. According to their understanding, the mission of civil society is to work together with the government and not to control them. Illiberal governments turn to the individual. They are consulted used as a reference in carrying out government policies instead of consulting organizations with information and representativity uh, in the areas concerned. So what can we learn from these developments? First, that against all odds, we can observe that Darendorf civil society is still with us. The idea of a civil society that's only mission is to support the government and the idea that organizations that challenge policies and government actions are to be excluded from the political community is still being widely questioned. The ethos of Darendorf civil society is still maintained by organizations, civil actions and individual beliefs. Um, in Hungary in April 2017, there were demonstrations in defense of academic freedom and free universities at the occasion of the conflict around the Central European University. Civil society organizations and individuals protested against the law on the transparency of organizations receiving support from abroad in 2017. In 2018, a strong network was established, the Hungarian Academy Staff Forum, in order to represent researchers while the government det detached their research institutes from the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Using civil society tools for their purposes, they decided to establish a former association in October this year. Demonstrations and other civil actions are frequent aiming for better education for children. You can see pictures from those events above. Second, there is a lesson about how to develop civil society. In the 1990s, there were financial resources available for our region in order to contribute to the capacity building of civil society. There were several mostly American donors, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Mott Foundation, the German Marshall Fund, and so on, who funded several projects in order to facilitate the transition by helping the development of civil society. 
While this help contributed significantly to the strengthening of the hardware of civil society, strong organizations, skills in project management, and so on, they contributed less to the software. Civic engagement, participation, volunteerism remained low. What our organizations learned from our recent experiences is that apart from concentrating on fundraising and potential donors, they should pay equal attention to the people around them. Local initiatives, grassroots organizations, the development of the embeddedness of organizations to local communities became more important than ever. Because local people are the ones who go to the street if organizations representing them are in danger. Third, recent research reveals the reverse correlation between civil society and populism. Tito Boeri and his authors in their paper published last year present evidence that individuals belonging to associations are less likely by 2.4 to 4.2 percent to vote for populist parties. That, that is considerable since the average vote share for populist parties is from 10 to 15 percent. This finding supports the centuries old thoughts of Alexis de Tocqueville who believed that associations operating outside the sphere of government and economic life, that we now refer as civil society, were essential bulwarks against economic uh, uh, democratic decay. He said, and I quote, in democratic countries, the science of associations is the mother of science. The progress of order as depends upon the progress it has made. In book two of the democracy in America, he says, and I quote again, by the aid of associations, men endeavored to defend themselves against the despotic influence of a majority or against the aggression of regal power. If each citizen did not learn in proportion as he individually becomes more feeble and consequently more incapable of preserving his freedom single-handed, to combine with his fellow citizens for the purpose of def def defending it, it is clear that tyranny would in unavoidably increase. This lesson is to be learned not only in East Central Europe, but in all populist countries. While preparing this talk, I of course kept listening to the news. November the 15th, I read <coughs> a report on an event celebrating the 20th anniversary of the existence of the Committee of National Resem Remembrance. A speech was given by Laszlo Kövér, current speaker of the National Assembly in Hungary, a leading Fidesz politician. <coughs> politician. Uh, as the news said, he quoted a German social scientist when saying constitutional reform may take six months, economic reform six years, but 60 years may be necessary to lay the foundation, the social foundations required. So, Rav Darendorf seems to be with us in each political family. Things might not be that hopeless after all. Thank you. Thank you a lot for your um, insightful views in the Hungarian uh, system. And now, um, Professor Anhaya. Yeah, uh Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you see me in a somewhat unusual position, being sandwiched between the two presenters, and usually the commentator sits where you sit, so when the going gets rough, I can still get out, but it's much more difficult. No uh, no. Um, so uh, I think John has presented us with a highly learned and ultimately very encouraging essay on civil society, starting with its origin, reviewing its rise and demise, and addressing its current renewal, or at least the potential for it, and Christina stays close to Darndorf's notion of civil society as she reviews the developments in Central and Eastern Europe from the 1980s to the present and declares Darndorf is still with us and his notion of civil society matters. Uh, that's what you say on, on page five. In my comments, I will focus on one aspect and that is the relationship between uh, civil society and the non-profit or voluntary or, or third sector. Because when I read your piece, uh, John, we are on page 
11, you accused me of being a willing accomplice of neoliberalism. Uh, I thought, how is that possible? Because um, we've known each other for so long. Uh, you accused me of being a neo crumption at one point, and I didn't even know what it was. I had, to, I had to look it up. And I understood what you were trying to say, but a, a, a accomplice of neoliberalism, that went a bit far. So I, I sat down last night. Uh, I think. Wolfgang, you and I, we probably worked quite late last night, uh, you for a different reason, but I was driven by an intellectual passion, and I wrote this 10-page essay uh, on uh, the use and misuse of the term civil society. Right? Uh, if you're interested, I have a few extra copies, but I, I just want to summarize uh, what, what uh, I try to express, and it relates very much to the two papers we've just heard. Now, uh, but let me start with an episode that is um, very central to what I'm uh, going to lay out in the few minutes that, that I have. Uh, in 1998, I had just arrived at the Lund School of Economics, and it was a year um, uh, of great hope for many in, in, in Great Britain, because it was the first year after Thatcherism, it was the first year of, of new labor in power. And, and there was uh, an active community unit being established um, in the Home Office. And Jeff Morgan, whom you cite at one point, uh, uh, ran it. And, uh, so, uh, and I thought I, I need to have an intellectual uh, mark now early on in my tenure at LSC. So I said, let's have a conference on the third way and the third sector. And Tony Giddens was all for it, of course. So we, we had this conference, and Jeff Morgan comes up. Uh, and I have to say, that was before uh, we had PowerPoint. Or well, PowerPoint was just coming, so very few people use it. Normally, we were traveling with transparencies. Right? And you put them on an overhead projector. And so Jeff Morgan entered, he was on the podium. He entered, and he put uh, three circles down. One circle was the market, the other circle was the state or the public sector, and then there was the voluntary sector. And one on top of each other, but so that there was a, 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 some overlap. So he had many intersections. And he said that this is, what, this is the vision of joint up governance and of a close cooperation between the government and the voluntary sector. And I was watching Ralph Darndorf sitting, he was sitting next to me, getting ever more impatient. And then he got up and walked to the podium and pulled the three slides apart. And he said, this is the wrong way to think about society and the role of government. It is not the role of civil society to be a subservient or an extension branch, extension service of government, and it's not the role of civil society to be in bed with business. The role of civil society, and we heard it from both of you, right, is to be, and uh, you, in fact, you have a very good definition of civil society, which I use in my teaching a lot, and, and also Ernest Gellner, the idea that it's a countervailing force, which is very critical. And a countervailing force was against the market and the state to keep society more balanced. And that countervailing force is not about being nice, it is about also conflict. And here's uh, Ralph Darnold of the conflict theorist. And for him, civil society was one way in which societies, modern societies, manage conflicts. Right? And that is what uh, I think uh, annoyed him when he saw Jeff Morgan uh, losing what is, in fact, the ultimate rationale of civil society, uh, bringing diverse interests and preferences to the forefront, right? And allowing this kind of self-organization and giving voice and agency to very diverse groups of people, but not in an egalitarian sense, but in a highly competitive sense, right? So for him, civil society was competing interests, uh, interests other than economic and political interests in a more narrow sense. Now, uh, why did Jeff Morgan and have such a different vision of what civil society is compared to, uh, to Ralph Darndorf. And also, at the heart of your criticism about the non-profit research agenda is about that. Because they, they took very different starting points. Right? So, the, uh, 
the, the nonprofit research agenda is a product of 1980s America, when it was a, you might say, a soul-searching and self-justifying exercise to explain why the United States has no welfare state and why the United States relies so heavily on, on charity, on foundations, and uh, civic action. And out of that came a, a research agenda that was driven by economists. And they tried to un explain why do we, in market economies, have organizations that voluntarily adopt a non-distribution constraint, which would then be the non-profit status. Right? And theories were proposed, and I don't want to repeat those theories here, but there was a research agenda that developed in the 1980s into the 1990s, totally separated from civil society. In fact, they wouldn't even know the term at that time, because they were economists. Right? And then something very curious happened, that is the events in Central and Eastern Europe. And, and the question became, how do we privatize some of the services that are, were previously nationalized? Right? And that when American economists and American foundations came to the forefront and said, well, we have a nonprofit sector, would you not to have one too? Right? I'm putting it very simple. And that coincided with the emphasis on, civil, on the civil society dialogue that came out of the dissident movements and in which you took part uh, in Central and Eastern Europe and which also, uh, that's a footnote, happened in Latin America. Right? But these came together and it was facilitated by two forces. One is um, uh, American foundations saw the, the, you might say, the elective affinity between these terms. And they moved in with their resources into Central and Eastern Europe. And what used to be the nonprofit sector very quickly became civil society. Right? And that is probably where you had these willing accomplices at that time, because people were, they thought, oh, civil society is what gives us grant money. And uh, you could make the argument we were perhaps a bit disingenuous that we played a game. Right? So, in um, uh, you cite a book of, of mine with Lester Salomon. That's absolutely right. In 1996, we published a book that was called The Nonprofit Sector International, something like that. Three years later, we published basically the same book with more countries, and we called it Civil Society. Right? And, and we have never managed to get out of this conundrum. Right? And how do we get out of it? I, I think we, uh, we, we, have to be, we have to be honest. And we have to be honest and say that historically and currently, you can have a non-profit sector, you can have a, thought, a third sector without having a civil society. Okay? Because that is exactly what we are observing in Russia. Russia is building a non-profit sector subservient to the government, but it is devoid of pretty much any of the civil society. No, it's the same happens in China. Right? And you could say historically, in this country, we had also uh, cases where in a, uh, between the 1870s and uh, certainly the end of uh, World War I, we had the emergence of certain civil society organizations, but they were quite uh, small. But what we had mostly were politically convenient and controllable organizations that uh, had a concession of behalf of an autocratic regime at that time to operate with some form of liberty. And this concession system is in fact what brings the non-profit sector, uh, what is behind the growth of the non-profit sector in countries like, um, and even in, in, in illiberal uh, uh, countries in uh, Eastern Europe at the moment. Uh, and we, in, in Germany, we know we pride ourselves on our uh, liberty and all of that, but until uh, the year 2000, we did have the concession system in place for the establishment of a charitable foundation. So it's quite late that we really removed state control from uh, organizations in civil society. Final point I want to make is that uh, if you look at the third sector, or the non-profit sector, whatever you call it, it, it requires quite different theories. And we have not really looked at how, what, whether these theories apply to civil society. No? So if you 
look at most of the argument in economics, they are about non-profit service providers. Right? And they, they tell us very little about why do we have foundations. And they tell us also very little about why do we have associations. And then civil society research or the debates about civil society uh, have a, a one deficiency that uh, I, I would like to know what you, what you think about it. One, uh, the deficiency is that it's sometimes not very clear whether the argument is a conceptual argument or a kind of a historic history of ideas argument about the concept of civil society, whether it's about its empirical manifestations of civil society, or whether it is a theoretical explanation of why do we have civil society, and finally, whether it is really a political historical description of, of what's happened. And I think uh, I would criticize the nonprofit sector research in which I grew up by not being uh, very honest at some times, and that's very systematic in relation to civil society. And I would say the civil society research agenda uh, could benefit a more, uh, more systematic approach, perhaps, more empirical approach. Can the two come together, nonprofits research and civil society research? Yes, but let's keep them separate and don't mingle them together. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Um, being mindful of the time, um, I would like to combine your responses with two brief questions from the audience. Yeah, two. Uh, Klaus Otto, please, and. Okay, thank you very much. That was really eye opening and. Uh, <coughs> reminded me of uh, many things. Um, the first time I had a paper on my desk with, with the title Civil Society, or the, the term Civil Society, was in the late 80s when uh, John Keane uh, shared one of his uh, manuscripts with the title towards a socialist civil society, question mark. Uh, and that, uh, I remember that 79 or 80 or something. And I read it with great interest and I tried to find a German term uh, of, to translate it. And that made no sense. Socialistische Bürgerliche Gesellschaft, right? What does that mean? And uh, then, uh, uh, due to that difficulty, the term Zivilgesellschaft was uh, coined in German, and this has never appeared before, Zivilgesellschaft, since the early 19th century, Bürgerliche Gesellschaft. Okay, but just, I, I, and I tried really hard to make sense of it, and one way to do so is to, uh, ask the question, what is the opposite of civil society? Um, what is uh, f f social formations that are definitely not? And this is the practice that you have also uh, used. First, it is non-governmental. Uh, non Second, it is non-profit. And I added a third, namely non-tribal, that is, you become a member of civil society associations uh, not due to some um, passport identities, right? Or ethnic identities or something. Um, but that leaves so many things uh, in the civil society bag. The bag is simply too, uh, too big. The Federation of German Industry, a local choral society, uh, a professional association, a sports club, many other things. So, so it is not uh, distinctive enough, in a way, to, to uh, define it that way. And uh, it has clearly American roots, uh, going back to uh, uh, Tocqueville, as you rightly pointed out. Uh, is, uh, Tocqueville is clearly the father of the whole, whole idea. Then it was revived after the war 
in the uh, political sociology of William Kornhauser and uh, uh, later uh, Bob Putnam uh, in, in uh, making democracy work uh, and uh, was uh, then uh, <coughs> uh, used uh, uh, elective affinity with liberal communitarianism. Uh, that, that is a line that I think uh, makes a question. Uh, is there any political content in uh, or leaning or uh, uh, if inspiration uh, in the term of uh, civil society along a left-right axis? Uh, uh, what is the relation to deliberative democracy and deliberation? And um, also, what is the uh, relation of civil society to the powerful ideological and practical trend of the 80s and 90s? Uh, I mean, a version of neoliberalism, which uh, comes under the slogan from uh, welfare state to welfare society. Uh, 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 Thatcher, uh, on, on mental hospitals, give the inmates back to the community. Uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> also uh, the, the idea of corporate social responsibility is something. So, so what are these elective um, uh, affinities of uh, today's use of uh, civil society? Thank you. Uh, thank you. One more brief question, and another from Mr. Merkel. We only have 10 minutes left. So to give the um, present, uh, the speakers and the, um, uh, the discussion the possibility to answer, so very brief, please. Uh, first. I mean, one of the problems is whether civil society is an analytical term or it's a, a kind of advocacy. And of course, it sounds uh, as if it uh, is used as a kind of advocacy. And that means that, let's say, pro-life uh, movements in the United States or uh, uh, movements on, of, uh, of Hezbollah uh, adherents in Germany or uh, uh, Pegida, they are not counted as uh, civil society then. And but that, I think, is a uh, miss analytical power to describe what happens in the society. And that, I think, is a problem. Uh, I, don't, I have no solution, but uh, you could also say protest movements and use a, in, in, in a, a lesser complicated, a lesser value-laden term. And to uh, Helmut Anheyer, uh, we thought of uh, civil society, the function of civil society would be to provide more participation. But to provide more participation, and they have, many movements have been very successful, that means that they collaborate with the government. Yeah, so they are incorporated in the mechanisms of neo-corporatism. And uh, that is, uh, maybe it's a tragedy of success, but it's still a success. Thank you. Mr. Merck? Uh, sorry, there's one question. One, <clears throat> one short question to Christina. Uh, Hungary and Poland were the only uh, regimes uh, during the Soviet time with some kind of civil society. They uh, consolidated fastest their democracy after 1990, but they all, uh, also deconsolidated uh, their democracy fasted. What was the role of civil society? Did we uh, face uh, the transformation towards the dark sides of civil society? Thank you. Um, I propose that we have a, a short round for answering the questions. And I would like to start or give the word to Christina Arato. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, I very much feel at home, thank you very much, uh, because whenever I'm involved in a debate about civil society, we always end up in the definitional problem. Mm. So, absolutely, uh, usual stuff. Uh, when, when I have to define civil society, I always uh, think that this is a, a threefold concept. It has an organizational side, it has an action side, because there are movements, events, networks, behaviors, without necessarily formally uh, being organized. And there is this um, individual attitude also, like civil courage. Uh, and, uh, and I think on the organizational level, there is this connection to what we call the non-profit sector, mm -hmm. although it is very difficult to detach, of course, because uh, our party uh, foundation, civil society, or politics. So there is this blurred boundaries, but basically this, is, this belongs to the concept. Um, uh, Professor Offa uh, uh, raised the issue of whether there is a political content to civil society or uh, uh, I think I think I would not say political I would say there is a certain value on the basis of this concept uh, in the early uh, 2000s there were some uh, uh, some um, uh, articles uh, with the concept of bad civil society. It suggested that there are, uh, there are movements, uh, especially uh, also paramilitary movements, uh, that actually organize uh, on the basis of free will. Uh, people spend their, uh, their time together uh, according to their shared values. They are ready to donate. Uh, they they contribute to uh, to their common uh, uh, common aims and uh, on the basis of their common values. Uh, still, uh, they they may be uh, uh, acting uh, against the constitutional values of uh, of their country. Uh, so so this is why I usually say that civil society is not without a value. It's a it's a value driven concept because. It, uh, it, is, it is there to respect uh, the constitutional uh, values of, of the community of, of liberal democracy. Uh, uh, Poland and Hungary being first to, uh, to um, do the transition and uh, with a, a sort of active uh, civil society and be, be the first to, uh, to, uh, to move back. Uh, well, actually, I think, uh, uh, as I said, I think uh, donations have to be re... Uh, if, if there is another round of donations after our period, which is coming, I'm sure, and I don't know, but uh, uh, then uh, it has to be uh, uh, kept in mind that, uh, uh, that helping, also financial help is necessary, uh, but we should not... Uh, uh, turn the attention of people who organized only to the buzzwords of the donors. Uh, so, so we have to keep in mind that, uh, uh, that, that people look out to their own, these organizations look out to their own communities. And the other, which is not an outside factor, is that uh, the people who were active in civil society uh, around our regime change, they went to politics and uh, they left civil society. Uh, so uh, this might, I, I'm not saying this contributed to, uh, to the democratic backsliding as of today, but still it, uh, it transformed civil society in, in these two countries. Thank you. Mr. Anheuer? Oh, um, I, I, I truly believe that you should have the last word, mm. which, which is uh, what happened. Um, I think I'm, I'm worried about the technocratic use. Uh, I'm, I'm worried about the technocratic use of the term civil society, and um, we also we already saw it through the acquis communautaire in the 1990s and into the 2000s through the uh, accession process. But it it has taken root in Brussels, and you know Ralph Darnold was a commissioner. I, I think he would be up in arms when he when he now finds that the term civil society is used in such a technocratic. Uh, way and you 
uh, have as part of the European semester now a formal consultation with civil society, but who's sitting there? You know, various interest groups, and they just have the label civil society on them, and I think that is just a short-sighted version of the potential uh, the concept has, and which I think you beautifully lay out in the, second, in the last part of your, your paper. Um, and to your question about social participation, well, in, this is how it, 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 it typically works. In, but this is pretty much the, the US background to that, but in Europe too. Uh, uh, you have a social movement, and the social movement becomes, uh, uh, draws on the participation of many, it becomes successful, it's translated into some NGO or some non-profit organization, and, and then it starts negotiating with government, and the government picks up the concerns and uh, introduces policies. In the process of that, participation goes down. Right? And, but that's, uh, it's, it's called third party uh, government uh, because ultimately at some point uh, the, the federal government and the state governments start funding non-profits as a service delivery organization to take care of a particular problem. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Right? But I think it's something that comes out of civil society but does it then stay in civil society? It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to. Uh, it's late in the day. Uh, it's almost morning for me, so I'm beginning to feel quite fresh. Um, three quick things to um, Klaus offers bundle of questions. Um, I think what does the category of civil society as it has been used for 40 years, what does it, what are its connotations um, in matters of the political? Uh, the impact it had on me uh, as a language, so to say, in thinking about politics is that it, it, it enriched and pluralized our understanding of the political. The political, from the standpoint of much of the work on civil society, means, first of all, in the sense of Max Weber, um, the kinds of politics that happens in elections that are orientated to state structures and resources and redistribution or not. Um, politics is about state institutions, but civil society also, that language, helped revive the Arendtian understanding of politics as about public assembly of people gathering together and finding themselves and, 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 and insisting that the power so generated um, could have mm. effects. But I also think that um, for their different reasons, Václav Havel and Michel Foucault added a third understanding of the political. The political is what happens in the nooks and crannies of of a civil society, what happens in the household and what happens in the cup of coffee, as Václav Havel liked to say, um, with a friend. Um, and so um, that's quite an achievement, I think, to put it in this way, that, that, the, that the, the revival of that 19th century language of civil society that kind of disappeared. There were some exceptions, Durkheim, John Dewey, but that revival, I think, has had enriching effects on what we understand by the political. The second thing I wanted to say was um, to do with, it's a much darker thought, and it's a, a, it's a way of understanding what Christina had to say. I think that, um, uh, this is to do with populism and where it is leading us, um, where it leads. Uh, of course, it's a problem to define it, but one thought um, that's, uh, I think, um, worth pondering is that a hundred years ago, um, there were two texts written, Max Weber's um, Politik als Beruf, which speaks about in a period when the people are coming onto the stage of history, so to say, where he uh, uh, thinks that Führer Demokratie um, will likely be a chronic feature of electoral representative democracy, and he was right about this. But in that same year, there was a Venezuelan 
Loriano Vajania Lanz, who um, predicted in the same context that democratic Caesarism um, might be a solution to, uh, uh, to the people problem. And what he meant by that is what it seems to me, to put it very crudely, um, is being built in Hungary um, and in many other polities, um, a kind of Hobbesian, um, democratic Hobbesian state which absorbs civil society, has a phantom civil society, but is um, a form, a new form of despotism. It's a book that I have coming out in a couple of months. It um, looks at uh, not only um, the Central Asian republics and Turkey and China and Russia um, and Saudi and Belarus and asks what they have in common. I think they are despotisms in that one of their remarkable features is that those who rule pay attention to the people, constantly concerned about consultation, and they develop all these so-called phantom democratic mechanisms. Uh, and in this book, I try to suggest that if you peer into the distance and imagine that number 45 is re-elected, um, that in this process, the destruction of rule of law in the name of the people, the destruction of flanking institutions is a real possibility. Um, so um, this is a, a second remark about, I mean, a, a way of interpreting what Christina had very helpfully to say, that this is not, this is a form of power um, uh, that uh, is not totalitarian, it is not fascist, it's something other because it doesn't destroy um, civil organizations, it makes them, it turns them into appendages, it even speaks the language of civil society. And the third thing finally to say is um, about Klaus's remarkable memory of um, a typewritten um, a piece which was the sketch of a project that did happen, um, where the word, the phrase socialist civil society was used. Um, I, I have to say that um, in, on the property question, which I think uh, I tried in the paper to raise and I think we've not talked about enough, I am old fashioned because striking is that every um, intellectual and writer who use the category of civil society in European languages from just prior to the French Revolution through to uh, Tocqueville and Marx, every one of them included the property, the matter of property inside the category. So the spread of commodity production exchange was a problem that had to be dealt with if one wanted to talk in high terms about civil associations and liberties of association and, and so on. That rather dropped out of the discussion in uh, the last uh, 40 years. And I think that um, in the longer paper, but insufficiently in my remarks, I, I would like to keep that old proposition alive. Um, that is, uh, and I think one uh, final remark, I, I, I think you can see in the revival, if I'm right about this language of civil society, the politics of civil society, several things that directly touch on the property question. One is that from civil society comes a critique of the oligarchs, babish, you know, crooked billionaires, uh, demanding from the civil society that they be held accountable and actually arrested uh, for their corrupt activities. You can also see, um, it's your phrase, uh, a politics from civil society of decommodification, insisting that some things are not to be marketized um, and that there should be a socialization of those um, uh, uh, relations of commodity production and exchange. I also think, finally, he here's where the disagreements happen in the language of civil society and the politics of it, that I think um, the old Polanyi idea that a civil society can only remain so if it, um, using various techniques, re-embeds capital inside its structures. 
Uh, and you can see this dynamic at work in what is to be done about the tech giants. You know, they have become free-floating um, engines of commodity production, exchange, and surveillance, and so on. But what are their social responsibilities? Um, and I think that um, a lot of legal matters and a lot of politics of civil society um, is, um, is directed at this problematic of, of re-embedding um, uh, uh, business inside civil society structures. Thank you, Lord. I need to interrupt you. I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> but me, I need, uh, we need, and I need to close this really exciting panel. And thank you a lot for the controversial discussion. And I hope there, there will be a lot of more discussions after this. Thank you a lot. All